So Java appeared uh, in the mid-90s. What was it about that time in, in the computer world that inspired you to do a new language? Well, I mean, it was really driven by the network. Right? So there was a group of us at Sun who were you know, sort of off trying to think about things that would affect what, what Sun was working on. And we you know, talked to lots of people all over the world. We, we you know, did this sort of, sort of grand world tour, talking to you know, people all over Europe and Asia who were building you know, s cell phones and televisions and locomotives and you know, all kinds of stuff. And you know, we were looking for places where people were using um, digital systems in, in interesting ways. And you know, we had always believed in sort of networking and we're sort of continuously amazed by the amount of impact that networking was starting to have on these systems. But you know, the, the, the sort of tragic thing for us was that, that these folks were sort of repeating a lot of the mistakes that the computer industry had gone through, you know, 20 years before. You know, so they were doing things like building networks where the, the where the where the address field was four bits long. You know, it's like, no, that's not going to work. Or, you know, you really have to do error correction. Or, no, doing error correction on a link doesn't matter. Yeah, you know, all these yeah. lessons. Um, and 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 so we were sort of looking at this collision between between the the world of, of folks who were doing consumer spacing facing stuff and the folks who were doing sort of more traditional computer kind of things. And then when you look at at, at what happens if if you get this sort of set of sort of consumer gear, uh, you know whether it's you know desktop computers or cell phones or whatever, and they're talking to each other. Um, there are all kinds of implications that, that come out of it from you know, things like you know, attitudes towards security and reliability um, to you know, having to worry about interoperability and you know, how do you think about building systems that, that, that span a network of heterogeneous things. Um, and you know, being a bunch of engineers, we you know, don't, weren't very good at writing papers much better at writing code, so we decided to build a prototype, and we built this thing called the Star 7. And when we started building it, we were building it in C and C++, and uh, one of the cool things about the, the project was that we had, um, the, the guy who was in charge wasn't an engineer. He was really a very cool sort of business development kind of guy. Yeah. and. You know, he kept thinking about it in terms of you know the way that technology was going to evolve, the way that businesses were going to evolve. You know, what was actually important to them. And you know, the more we thought about it, the more that you know became clear that the issues that we were having um, were more about well, that there were a lot of issues that we were having that were in sort of software engineering technology. And so my part of the project was to go off and sort of solve some of the software engineering problems. And you know that's the part of the project that that survived. Yeah, um, and that's the sort of time when new languages usually end up appearing, isn't it? Yeah, is it, yeah. Is it you know it was done as a tool for something else, yeah. and you know it's kind of the the, the reverse way to to view it is that 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 it was you know this 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 sort of petri dish that just happened to match the the the, the sort of future universe in which the the language could sort of grow and develop. And, yeah. You know, we, you know, got to that particular state because we, you know, had done all of this looking around and we were just seeing the way, the way people were sort of going and they were going in, in kind of a random direct, random sort of way. And, um, you know, we got to the right place in the right time. So I remember when it first came out, I wasn't really in the web industry back then, but I was into tinkering around of programming on, on RiskOS and, mm -hmm. and C and things like that. And I remember this... Uh, this uh, American thing called Java coming out, and you know, it had a really cool name because you know people didn't know what the coffees right. were in England back then. So you hear a Java, it's like, wow, there's this cool coffee, and, yeah. and it had a, had a really sort of um, kind of like maverick kind of vibe you get out of a lot of these ideas right. when they're quite young. Was that right. kind of a, a that did that maverick vibe kind of come from within that team, or was it something that Sun themselves are really pushing and 
And then kind of the second part of the story, how did it then turn into this huge beast that is dominating the world? Well, I mean, it's, it's sort of, you know, bits of everything. I mean, you know, the you know, Sun itself is, you know, a pretty maverick kind of company. It's, yeah. you know, one way to look at it is it's a bunch of, you know, 60, 60s hippie weirdo guys who sort of got together and to do something, to do a lot of stuff that sort of disturbed the rest of the universe. And, you yeah. know, when, when we started, you know, one of our principles was we had a network adapter in everything. And pretty much all of our competitors thought we were completely crazy. Um, and we weren't. Um, at least in retrospect, right? I mean, yeah. Um, and then you know when you know a group of us went off and did Java, you know, sort of within a within a company that was considered generally crazy, we were considered extra crazy. Um, you know, most of the folks inside Sun kind of looked at us very strangely. Yeah. Um, and so we were we, we we were kind of like a little collection of mavericks inside a big collection of mavericks, um, and you know, launching it was. And entertaining and painful, and you know, sort of an exercise in the in the in, yeah. you know the 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 Chinese curse, yeah. the apocryphal Ch Chinese curse, um, and we certainly lived in interesting times. Um, but you know, because we made it available to everybody, and because it it addressed a bunch of problems that most people were just beginning to think about. Right. And it, and it wasn't that it solved just one problem, but it solved like like a dozen of them, all at the same time. You know, one of the really interesting things in the early days is if you'd walk up to a person who was you know getting all excited about Java and ask them, so why are you excited about Java? They'd give you one reason. You'd ask somebody else, and they'd give you a completely different reason. Yeah. You know, and if you did it over a large enough group of people, you'd get like you know fifteen or twenty reasons, um, and and. You know, they they all actually fit together. You you've mentioned um, a few times before how, um, and I, I think you've hinted at the reason why Java was so successful, apart from it was solving some problems, but also because it had some fantastic timing to do with um, oh, how the industry was moving. And luck was yeah. a huge piece of it. And connectivity, of course, and 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 the net has has been really important right. to that. When I'm although, it's, although you know, it's it, it, you know, it's hard to know the difference between. You know, cause and effect. Yeah, sure. You know, you know, so, you know, so, you know, because in some sense, the the thing that caused Java to happen was the the the, the sort of emergence of the network as something that was available to con to consumers. Yeah. Um, but sort of the flip way to view of it is, oh, wasn't it lucky that Java came out when 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 networks did? Oh, well, lucky for us, right? Uh, right. <laughs> um, but you know, really, from my point of view, networks caused Java, so it wasn't yeah. really lucky. It was just it was, it, right it, it, was just, it was just sort of yielding to force. Yeah. So g given that, I mean, that one of the one of the beauties about Java, of course, is that you can develop something in essentially the same language as client side, server side, for for embedded mm -hmm. on devices and things. And and that's, I mean, that that's that spread Java basically everywhere. As we're looking at kind of um, one one thing that bothers me looking at mobile now is that you develop um, Java applications for mobile phones, you develop um, uh, Java applications on servers. But there doesn't appear to be yet. Maybe maybe it's because I'm biased looking at the gaming or consumer space, but it doesn't appear to be um, unbelievably tight integration between um, kind of like mobile clients and, and, and local and, and, and international networks. It seems to be kind of a bit separate. And, and that's even with Java. So I wonder if we're looking at things like the iPhone, which has a fairly esoteric hodgepodge of a programming language that is very, very client-side based. And um, developers won't necessarily be um, using similar languages or similar experience to develop the server-side code that runs it. Do you think the iPhone is actually um, it's almost like a mixed blessing. It's almost going to make people separate, whereas you're you're trying to make people join those skills together. Yeah, and and you know the the, 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 the fact that they make this you know big you know cleaving chop through the through the universe. Yeah. Um, you know I think is is tragically stupid. Yeah. Um, and you know you know it's 
would have been perfectly possible for them to use much more consistent, you know, right. you know be, be much more consistent with, 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 with both sides. Um, of course, they were they were obviously trying to build on OS X and, and yeah, you know the the you know the the, 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 the folks at, at Apple are you know face, famously isolationist, yeah, um, you know, and it's worked pretty well for them, um, you know, but it, it certainly doesn't doesn't need need to be that way, and yeah. you know interoperability has worked pretty well with 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 Java certainly on sort of desktop server systems it works. Excellently, yep. um, you, know, you know. Some of the cell phone worlds are a little are a little on the ragged side. Yeah, um, I mean, Apple's kind of done two things there. On the one hand, they've basically made the cell phone operators wake up and say, "Oh my God, we've we've got to start doing something differently." Particularly the ones who don't have the iPhone on their network, right. which is a good thing. But in the way it's disrupted, um, I mean, they they've done some fantastic innovation on the client side in terms of motion detection. But I wonder because the iPhone is itself is quite in isolation from the network in a way. If you look at by compare NTT.com and the stuff that they're doing right. over there, which is obviously Java based, I'm wondering that on the one hand they've created this awesome opportunity, on the other that they've taken away because everyone's want to do like client focused stuff as opposed to network focused stuff. Mm. I, I wonder if that's going to be uh, you know, annoying in the future. It, it's. It's hard to know. I mean, the you know when you look at the at the Docomo phones, they have all the all all the whizzy features and more that the, that the iPhone has, um, and the and the the Docomo phones are actually made by half a dozen different handset ma manufacturers. Yeah. NTT Docomo is the phone company, um, and they just sort of set specs for, for for feature sets and you know a lot of the innovation that Apple does things like motion sensors. I mean, motion sensors have been around for that's right. For yeah. donkey's years, right? You know yeah. the, the 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 thing that 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 Apple's been pretty good at is 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 going well. Yeah, it would make things more expensive, but it'd be really useful. And then yeah. they tend to vote on the, you know, make it use, you know, make it you know more useful but expensive. And you know, and a lot of a lot of handset makers there in this this sort of. You know, vicious drive to the lowest possible price, and you know that tends to you know yeah. be a, a complete killer for, for 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 any kind of innovation because you know adding something like a motion sensor to a, to a cell phone it costs money. Yeah. So um, we, we've got to wrap up now, but I want to ask you one final question. So I know you're uh, you're obviously quite tied to Java, and uh, to use your own words, yeah. um, but you're obviously passionate about um, open source technologies and, and other things. If there was one thing you could work on in the area of in tech that wasn't Java that you could do, like real, you know, really put your energy into, what would it be right now? Oh God, it would be really hard to know. I mean, there are there, are, you know, I. There are lots of things that I play with that I really, really enjoy. Right? So, like, I really enjoy 3D modeling. Right. You know, I do 3D modeling as kind of a hobby. If you, you know, the the a lot of the T-shirts that we use at Java One are actually ones that I do yeah, myself. And I see with from your site as well. You've uh, got a lot of 3D models on it. Yeah, yeah, and and I mostly do those. And you know, I I, I have I have no skill, but it's but it's fun. Um, you know, and part of me would go, oh, geez, you know, maybe I'll go do that. Yeah. Right? But then you know, there's another part of me that goes, oh, you know, I really like building embedded systems. Yeah. And you know, there's, you know, I was talking with some friends, and you know, we, we, we hatched this plot to do, you know, sensors in the middle of the Pacific. You know, <laughs> you know, autonomous robotic, you know, sensors that are, you know, these these these, you know, autonomous robotic sailboats. That does sound pretty cool, actually. <laughs> you know, and 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 the reason you want to do sailboats is because they don't require much energy, and yeah. in fact, you can use the sail to generate electricity. Why hasn't uh, anyone done that? I don't know. It seems like <laughs> such an obvious thing to do, and 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 people are doing it with planes all the time, and it's got to be way easier. Well, no, well, is it easier with boats? I'm not sure. Well, uh, certainly a sailboat is really easy to do. The control systems for them is is pretty easy. The the hard thing about about something like that is living in a marine environment, yeah. um, you know, for months and months at a time, right? And you know, right now, you know, there are no sensors in the middle of the Pacific, or there are very a small number of them because you have to like go out with a crew with a lot of people go out there, drop the sensors there, and they drift around. Yeah. 
what if the sensors were intelligent and being able to move themselves around and harvest the energy that's around them, which is, yeah. you know, wind and sun? There's not a lot of energy out of sun, but there's a lot of energy in the wind. It's a great opportunity to explore the seas and learn more about ecology and things. Yeah. Someone should do that. Yeah. And speak that to the guys be... at MIT, tell them they've got to do their yeah, grant no, projects. No. No. There, there, there's a, there's, a, there's a, a competition run by some folks in the UK that is you know, robot sailboats across the Atlantic. And this is sort of how this con conversation got started with my friends. It's like, oh, we should enter that contest. And it's like, but these would actually be useful because yeah. you could build cool, you know, sensor nets over the ocean. <sighs> <All right. laughs> that's, that's one maybe for a future weekend yeah. project. And, you know, the world is just filled with fun projects like that. Brilliant. Well, uh, thanks very much for talking to us today. It's been, it's been great. Well, thanks. Thank you. Thanks.